Hello, I'm Gemma Atkinson and welcome to The Petcast, brought to you by leading pet charity, Blue Cross. This episode is all about bereavement. I was in the car, boyfriend went to the door and said, is there any way you've seen a, a dog? And she said, oh, was it black and brindle? We said, yeah. So my heart lit up. I was like, oh my God, they've got her. And she gave my boyfriend the chain and said, we've shot her. First Dates waitress Laura Tott lost her dog in the most horrific circumstances. She's here telling us how she coped with the loss of her beloved Lucy. I had to look at pictures of her. I rang everyone saying, can you send me videos that you've got of her, send me memories that you have. Sean didn't want to see any of that. Plus, Blue Cross's Diane James is talking to me about the help they offer at the Pet Bereavement Support Service. We meet people all the time who say they feel so guilty over it, but I have to tell them, think of all the good things, break it down, I think of all the good life that they had, and at the end, you still love them enough to help them. And that's what we do on the Petcast. We have candid conversations around the big issues facing pet lovers like me and you, with some of the UK's leading pet experts on hand to give us their best tips, tricks and guidance. Diane James, welcome to the Petcast. Um, Diane, tell us what it is uh, you do for a living. What's your job? Uh, I work for Blue Cross and I'm manager of the Pet Bereavement Support Service. And it's exactly as it sounds. We support people through any bereavement of a pet, not only death, any loss at all. And we also train people how to deal with bereavement, as such as vets and organisations that work with animals. So I take it you, you're taking calls and emails from a lot of people literally all the way through the year. We do. We have uh, It's entirely run by volunteers located all around the UK. And last year, it was over 14,000 calls and emails we actually physically answered. Wow. That's, I it, I'll say a shocking number, but it's not, because we're a nation of animal lovers, we're a nation of pet lovers, um, and the death of a pet is it's so heartbreaking. What kind of things would you recommend to help people cope with the, the loss of a pet? Uh, it's personally sort of dependent on that individual because we're all different. Um, sorts of things we recommend are, first of all, if they find it difficult to accept, is to talk to the vet again if it was involved with uh, any treatment at the vet that they didn't understand. Uh, also, as well, talking to people in general. Sometimes we shy away from family and friends because we feel by doing that we're helping them. Mm. But, you know, talking really does help. So, for example, ringing us, we can tell them all about memorialising it um, and just get them out into the open chatting normally. And I suppose, I think only people with a pet will understand this, but for me personally, I always think that grieving for a pet is very similar, if not the same for grieving for a human, you know, the, because people with with Fergie, our first dog, she was 16 and a half when she passed away. So for 16 years of my life, Fergie was with me every single day. She used to sleep in my bed, we'd go for walks, and then suddenly they're not there. And I think unless you have a pet yourself, you, you don't understand the... The, the, the attachment and the loss but it is I imagine you know you've dealt with both it is similar I, I assume for for grieving a human do you know it is and I've experienced both like most people have and my pet same as Fergie was with you my dogs are part of my family mm. um, you know they're then in day in day out we get a routine we love them their love is unconditional same for any animal horse skinny pig you know you, you form a relationship with it that it's just such an unconditional one uh, and it is devastating for people and you kind of feel like, I mean, not so for me because I was a, a child, but my mum said she, she kind of felt a responsibility because it was our pet. And you think to yourself, I'm, I'm responsible for, you know, for keeping them here and for doing this and that. So there's almost, I think sometimes, even though it's no fault of our own, it's natural, it's what happens. There's an element of, of guilt as well, I assume, with some people. Do you know guilt is the most common thing that comes up with us when we speak to people or work with them? Um, and the guilt of, did I do enough? Was it too soon? Could I have gone somewhere else? Well, when I signed the, the, the paperwork in the vets to, to have it to euthanise, is that correct? And the, the guilt massively, massively um, comes into people who are grieving their animals. Mm, and it must be the most difficult decision to make. Um, you know, I, I'm an owner, I've got two dogs now, and I know that when, you know, the time comes, although my mum, I'm still very close to her, it's going to be my decision when that you know i have to make that call to the vet um ollie's nine and norman's eight so i'm hoping it's a long long time off but i still now sometimes when i'm playing with them it goes through my head it's going to be on me to make that decision and i i don't know if i'll be able to do it i think i might be I'd say to my mum you're gonna to have to do it for me but i know she'll turn around and say no you you have to there's only you who can make it because then you can accept it and, and move on from it i suppose and you know she's right as well because it's a decision that you and your family have to make as a unit or if you're on your own you have to sadly face that. 
Uh, it's probably the kindest thing because if you listen to the vet's advice, then and you're doing the best thing that you could for something that you love so much. Mm. And it is hard, really hard, to have to face that. Um, and we get calls and we meet people all the time who say they feel so guilty over it. But I have to tell them, think of all the good things. Break it down and think of all the good life that they had and at the end you still love them enough to help them. Do you get like families calling on behalf of their children? Because it must be a lot harder to explain to a child why, you know, especially if they were born into a home, like, for example, my daughter Mia, she's born into a home with two dogs. You know, I'm going to have to explain to her one day why they're not here. And that, again, terrifies me. So what advice would you give to someone in that situation? Do you know, this is something where we prepare people for life because, sadly, every living thing dies. So the best thing is, is you know your own child, be honest. Don't make it gory or gruesome, but just be totally honest. There's no point saying it's gone to live on a farm because they don't understand it. Uh, they'll think they've done wrong. It's, it's important that if we get it right from the beginning, we explain it properly. Um, and we're preparing them really for when they lose human beings as well. It's the first best way to deal with it is honesty. And a lot of places like uh, workplaces, um, when, when a someone loses someone in their family they're very understanding they'll give you time off to grieve they'll give you time off for the funeral and they're very supportive um is that the same are you finding with employees who have a pet passed away or is it kind of just looked over now it's getting better which is wonderful to hear from me um what we're finding now is people are more understanding and accepting a pet loss we totally understand that to give people off time in businesses is very difficult anyway and people say, how can you for a pet? What we're saying is just be more compassionate and understanding. Mm. If somebody can't come to work and they'd rather be honest and say, I can't come in today because my dog's died or my horse or I've been affected greatly by it, just be understanding. Um, the world out there is getting better. The last five years have been huge improvements in people accepting and understanding pet bereavement. Mm, we had a lady at our place, her cat had gone missing and she just didn't come into work because she said, my cat might come home and I need to be there. And she, she took time off and they were very understanding of it. Um, and the cat did eventually come home, so it was all power to her. She made the, the, made the right decision. But there was a few people who were saying, oh, it's only a cat. You know, she'll come home when it's ready. And, but for her, it wasn't only a cat. It was a cat that she, she'd she got as a kitten at a time when she was in a really low period in her life. So that cat had brought her back to life, essentially. Um, and so she just couldn't bear the thought of not being home if he decided to, to come back home. And, you know, she was so happy when he did. Um, so I think, I think more workplaces need to, like you say, understand. They do. And we often get the comment, it's only a cat, only a dog, only a rabbit. What people need to realise is it might be the only thing that person has in their life or the last link to somebody they loved and lost. It's, it's really important that people just understand everyone is different. Yeah, totally. And if, you, if you're if you a friend of a family member or you know a relative of, of, of someone who's lost a pet suddenly or they're grieving, what would, what would you say is the right thing to do to comfort them? Most important thing is not to avoid them because everybody tends to do that thinking that's what we want to be left alone. It's not, it's to go there to speak to them, whether it's by phone or in person, if they feel they can look at pictures um, and just let them talk or even just let them cry because sometimes silence is just as good for them. And what are the things that you you shouldn't say? I know there's, there's less of, you know, how you can, what you should do and what you can do to help, but there's, there's things that you, you, you shouldn't do. There are. I mean, definitely not saying that it's just a dog, a cat is the starter, but also people say it, it lived to a good age. Do you know, it doesn't matter if it's one or 20, it is never a good time for you to lose something. Um, so it's important that you don't try and avoid what they're saying, you don't try to dismiss it, and just let them be honest and talk about it. If it's traumatic, let them speak about it. Um, if you feel uncomfortable, again, you know, just let them speak. But the most important thing is to be there for them and for the person who's lost to realise it's normal. And we wanted to speak to you about the, the most difficult decision that any pet owner will have to face, euthanasia. It's a huge, huge mental burden, I would imagine, to have to make that decision, especially if, you know, if it's just you and your pet, it's hard enough. But if it's you, your pet, and you've got children who are clinging to that pet, what what's the thought process you go through with someone who's, I mean... Some people don't even have a lot of time to make the decision. The vet will say, look, it has to be done sooner rather than later. Some people have weeks, you know, and they're sat on the fence, do I, don't I? What would you, what would you say to them? If you're somebody that has to be done there and then um, and you obviously can't speak to the rest of your family, you're doing the best thing that you can. When you get back, it's communicating exactly why and what happened to those you, you love. If you get a bit of time, it's making memories. Um, you know you're going to have to have that 
at the end of it, but you make a bucket list, you take them out for special walks, special foods, um, get them a special toy. Mine loves watching the news, you know, we'd sit there and watch the news together. Um, so anything that you can make of memories, pictures, anything, so that you can build to that point, but communicating with your whole family unit, or if you're just a couple of yourself, doing what's right for you as well. But it yeah. is the hardest thing, I, I understand totally. My Norman, he's petrified of the vets. Whenever we go, as soon as he walks in, he's shaking. So I wouldn't want to have him put to sleep at the vet because I wouldn't want his last memory to be him frightened. Are, there, are people willing to come to your home so they can be in their own environment? They do. More and more vets now will come to your home because obviously if they're scared, it saves that journey for both of you because you're going to be really upset as well. Mm. Coming to your home environment will make it as easy as possible if it can be for you in its own bed with you there with your family whatever you want and they will even arrange then obviously for, for whatever you want afterwards for it to be cremated or however you want dealt with your animal they will do everything from start to finish i was going to ask you what happens next like is there a, is there a legal process to follow or is it a case of you can shoot you can bury them you can do do what you want depending i mean if it's a horse and it's going to be a huge sized animal there's a lot of legalities um, you know, sort of with passports and where they, they're buried, etc. With a smaller animal, if you want to bury it at home, it's important that you remember things like if you rent the house, is that possible? Are you going to move? Um, if you do own it and you do want to bury, there's things like water supplies, depth of animal, because obviously nowadays we have urban foxes as well as in the country, so you have to remember things like that. And then if you want it cremated, you can have it singly or communally. So you would just get your pet back, or you, it would just be that it would be scattered with other pets. I mean, our Fergie's in in a little urn in the back garden, and um, she's she's buried well down. But funny enough, Norman and Ollie do all do still wee on her. There's a little <laughs> ornament on top, and that's where they go to that's to wee. Love. <laughs> so yeah, that's what we're saying. Um, I should say that if there's anything that people want to find out more um, about what we're talking about here, pet bereavement, it is a real tough subject to talk about because everyone, like we say, we're a nation of animal lovers, but just go to bluecross.org.uk um, and click on Pet Advice and there's more information there. Diane, stay with me, but I want to introduce uh, our next guest, known for her role as a waitress on the dating show First Dates, it's Miss Laura Tott. Now, Laura experienced the most devastating loss in 2019 when her beloved dog Lucy was actually shot and killed whilst on a walk near her home. Welcome Laura. Um, I know it's going to be really difficult to talk about so thank you so much. We'll talk about the incident in a second but what was Lucy like? How did she come into your oh, life? Um, so I rescued Lucy from Manchester Dogs Home. Oh, um, nice. Always wanted a dog for myself. I kind of grew up with a dog. Um, she was more like a little rabbit. Um, <laughs> she was a tiny little, you know, like a Shih Tzu. She's like oh, a Lazarus, nice. I think. Yeah. Um, but I always wanted a dog for myself. Um, so I, And I knew it was always going to be a rescue because I just think there's so many dogs that need rescuing. Yeah. Um, so I went to Manchester Dogs Home, fell in love instantly. All the dogs were going crazy and there was just this little black dog just sitting there. And I, went, I bent down and like said hello to her and a little head just went like this on and I was tilt. like that's I said that's my dog she had everything I've probably ever looked for in a dog she had a bit of everything she had like that love inside her she had that cheeky side the sassy side she just had every characteristic you could ever want like she had everything Tell us what happened, you know, you said you were out uh, walking with Lucy. What happened on that day? Yeah, so took her to a reservoir, a um, beautiful reservoir around here. Um, and there's different areas. There was areas where you can have dog on a lead, dog off a lead. So I was with my boyfriend. Um, um, we'd gone to a part where we saw a sheep up in a field and it said you have to have your dogs on the lead. So she went on the lead and then we went through this gate and it said you could have your dogs off a lead. So there was a couple of other people with their dogs. So I let her off and I decided that I'd try and see if I could outrun her. Obviously never going to win. She was an absolute rocket. <laughs> <laughs> so I started running, um, partner stayed behind, and then she just carried on running, and that was the last time I saw her alive. Um, so she just she just went, and I thought, right, I'll give her 10 minutes, she's probably in the trees, there was loads of trees around, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So I gave her 10 minutes, and half an hour passed, and then got to about 40 minutes, but you don't want to leave that spot you're in, because I thought, well, she the knows. Comeback, yeah, yeah, so I said, she knows I'm here, so I don't, I don't want to move. So like we said about going one way, and I said, no, let's go this way. And then we said, well, how about we split and we go that way? And part of me is so grateful that we, for some reason, we didn't go this to the right. And if we would have, we would have actually watched her being shot. So I'm, yeah. something was telling us to not go that way. I don't know what it was when you look back. Cause, mm. and, but my boyfriend, he punishes himself every day for it because he says we should have gone right. And I said, but then we would have watched it. But he said we could have stopped it. But So we waited, I think it was about probably about an hour and it was starting to get dark then. 
and he said we're gonna have to go home and I said no nope, I am I said I will sleep in this park if I have to I'm not leaving without my dog so there was a like a bird stall and um, someone was doing like a bird charity so I went over and I said is there any chance you've seen a dog and they said no and then as I was walking off she said actually yeah I have she said there was a dog up up like in the field so over there and we're talking like a kilometre 1.5k away and I was like right okay and I said do you know what she looked like and she said no and she was really like quite evasive and I thought right okay sorry I'm getting my lips all shaking now no, um see. yeah so so then what we did we, we thought we thought right let's just go knock on some farmers because there was a few farms around so we said we go knock on some doors and they said that's not actually our land that's someone else's land so we we drove to the far, the other farm and I was in the car boyfriend went to the door and said is there any way you've seen a a dog and she said oh was it black and brindle we said yeah so my heart lit up I was like oh my god they've got her and she gave my boyfriend the chain and said we've shot her and I was like I I can't even I can't even remember what happened in that second I just so Sean's trying to sort sort this conversation out and I'm, I'm I'm on the floor I'm screaming like I just I've never had a reaction like it. I was screaming. I couldn't think. No, I like Sean was trying to calm me down. I don't just don't remember anything that happened after that. And what for what for what reason? Um, so she'd got into it was when we had really strong winds. So I think her nose. She'd managed to jump over a fence. I think and got into a farmer's field. She'd run like a, a good kilometre. And um, so you know it's called sheep worrying. So because she'd been chasing, there was like thirty sheep there. She'd been chasing them, thinking she was in heaven, and two yeah. of them died. Um, so I, I said, I completely understand. That's what the hardest bit about it for me is. I understand why it's happened. And I'm so like, I wish I could just say to her, what were you doing? Like, why why did you chase the sheep? But so, yeah, they said they tried to get her back and they couldn't. So she got shot with a rifle in the end. Um, yeah, so it was, it was horrific. So I came home with no dog. I suppose a farmer's got their responsibility as well, but I... I don't know what I do. So, yeah. I well, they um, they then buried her and wouldn't tell me where her body was. So I had to go to sleep that night, not knowing where she was, and I was convinced she was still alive. That she was in a hole somewhere. That she had basically looked, that her heart was still beating. I was like, what if she's alive? So I made Sean get up. I said, you're gonna have to go and find her. And he was like, Laura, we can't, we can't do this. Like, we can't. So I didn't sleep at all that night. And we finally got her body back after about thirty hours. I think it was. I was going to say, what was the follow-up? Did they so, finally... Well, I think Sean went up in the end and said, look, we'll pay for your sheep. We're so sorry about your loss. Obviously, it's a financial loss to you rather than a... I, I understand the emotional loss. Yeah, I, I said, this is an emotional loss. So finally, they um, they made Sean go and get her out of the, the hole. And then we, we managed to get her cremated, which and we got her bed, and I got to see her, which part of me wishes I probably didn't because I, them pulling me away from her, Sean had to physically pull me away from her, but the setup was beautiful. It was a private cremation because I didn't want anyone else's ashes. So, yeah, And it was beautiful. It was over the whole, you could see the whole of Manchester. It was stunning. She was on this little table, little candles, but yeah, Sean had to physically drag me out of there. And I, I don't know whether it was the right thing to see her in that state because she's obviously, she weren't Lucy. She's been in the ground for mm. like, yeah, like 30 hours and she was covered in mud. It, yeah, it wasn't my dog that I saw. So, and now that's the last image I've got of her. So I think, I don't know whether I'd recommend people to see, th- I don't know. I don't yeah. know if I did it right or not. Do you know it's a hard one because you needed closure? Yeah. But then sometimes it's better to remember as you knew her. Yeah. So it is really But I was hard. fighting myself the whole time. He was saying, do you want to see her? I said, yes. And then I was saying, actually, do I, do I not? But I think in that like, situation, you whatever decision you made would have been right and wrong because if you hadn't have seen her you'd now be saying yeah. I wish I'd have seen her exactly. one last time yeah. so if I think in that situation you you can't make a decision no. that's one way or the other you can just do it or don't do it but either way you're going to be thinking of yeah. it and I was like oh it was a mess absolute mess <laughs> but you know never blame yourself oh I blamed and, myself for weeks, and Sean as well weeks. because if you'd gone the other way the ifs always come in yeah we blamed ourselves for ages because I said I didn't get her trained properly, but it was just a freak accident. She just she just ran. She just didn't did come what back. Instinct yep. does with um, She followed her nose, and that was it. But it's taken me ages to not blame myself. I've always said I didn't get her trained properly. I I shouldn't have let her off the lead. I should have chased after her. We should have gone right. We shouldn't have gone left. It's you're always going to do it. I think. Mm. But I've finally come to terms with the fact that it's really hard. But I think it's not my fault. It's no, it's, absolutely it's a, it's a not. freak accident. Mm. And I, but you do, you blame yourself for weeks, and that was the hardest part of the grieving process, I think. And you know, that's what we find with most people is the ifs and the buts. If only I'd done this earlier. Um, and we try and say, look, take it section by section, 
remember the good things because yeah. you could not have done any more. Diane, there must be a big difference, well, there is, in, in being prepared. Same with humans. If, you know, God forbid you're told a relative's poorly, they've got a few months, or if you get a phone call at work, your relative's cross the road and something's happened. It's the same with pets. Do you deal with it differently if you're dealing with someone like in, in Laura's case or with my case? <clears throat> what we would tend to do is you'll go through all the normal grieving pattern that people will do, but again, like I keep saying, we're all different. And the hardest thing with yours, obviously, is is initially getting over that shock because in no way it was, it was a terrific, terrible accident that could not have been avoided. Yeah. Um, and the only thing that I can say to you is, is the same as we take to anybody, is try and remember the pictures of the good times because the, the, the saddest picture at the end that you remember was not Lucy. No. And that's how you've got to think of it. Think back to Lucy when you first got her with the little tilted head, all the good memories. Yeah. Um, and that is what we would say to people. And when we talk to them, we would say, tell us all about your good times. Um, and it is difficult. And, you you know, when something happens and it's a circumstance, it's an accident and it's devastating, um, it's just the same as, as knowing that, you know, in the build-up to it eventually happening anyway, the loss is, is huge. But uh, I would just say to you, you've done everything right. Just don't blame yourself. So I was trying to, literally two days after, I thought, right, I thought, I can't just sit here, I'm going to have to try and turn this into it, try and think of the good things. And I know it's probably way too soon, so I had to look at pictures of her, I had to, I rang everyone saying, can you send me videos that you've got of her, send me memories that you have. Sean didn't want to see any of that. So I think it just showed me that people deal with it very differently. You've got to, Mm. and I had to respect, he had to respect that I wanted to see all the pictures, the videos, and I had to respect that he didn't, he didn't want to see anything for, for a long time until he was ready and you know you're so right and, and that's a really good way to look at it because you're both in a relationship with the same pet and yet you do handle it differently Completely. Um, and it is and it's you know sometimes it doesn't hit people till a lot later mm-hmm. um, so it's always good to remember and that's why when you do rehome and hopefully people like you rehome rescue that you do it as a partnership and you, you do it for all the right reasons yeah. um, you know some people rush out and get another dog because it's right for them other people never count again it's right for them and one thing that goes through my mind, which gives me, I hate it whenever I'm walking Norman and Ollie and you see a poster on the, you know, missing cat, missing dog. I can't think of anything worse because there's no, there's never any closure if your pet isn't found. What support do you give to someone in that situation? That is perhaps the hardest because when you've got no closure and you can't go through um, the end and the loss, which is bad enough. What we say to people is, is you need to have some form of closure. So a memorial such as a bush or its favourite area or, you know, you make a, a collage of its pictures. And another thing as well is what we would do with a human, we'd do with an animal, write a letter, write down all the feelings that you've got. So even if you've not had a chance to close it, you can write to that pet. You can then put that behind its picture. You can burn it and put it into a fireplace or at least you get down how you feel and you can say what you never got the chance to say. So at what point, Diane, would you, if you're a parent and a pet's gone missing, um, I, th- I was reading it's a bit of a longer window for cats because they're more independent, but at, at what point would you sit the child down and explain that maybe the animal isn't coming home? When you've um, exhausted every avenue that you can do and its signs are the likelihood it isn't, be totally honest, sit that child down and explain to them that the likelihood is it won't come home um, and they will be upset, obviously. But then we say pictures, writing letters, uh, making collages, involving the child in some way in sort of memorialising the, the closure that they mm. haven't got. Um, you know, if amazingly it did return, it's brilliant, but sadly in most cases it doesn't. Um, and so well, that's what we would say to do, sort of have a little ceremony around the, the pet they've lost. Yeah, and, you know, it's... I mean, Laura here is proof that time time is a great healer and, and people can can move on and can pick themselves up. Or you said you've got two other dogs now. How how long was it before you, you so, got them? So some people might say it was a bit soon, but I just had I had a dog shaped hole to fill. Mm-hmm. Um, I love being around dogs, so I think I wait. I think it was about seven or eight weeks, and I mm-hmm. went and got I went and rescued Tommy. Um, so he's oh he's amazing. And then there was um a bit of an incident where someone had fostered another dog. Um, they weren't getting on, so the the company asked if I would step in and just go and help maybe foster until she was ready for adoption. Well, I couldn't. <laughs> She wasn't going nope, home. she weren't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I've now got two. Um, they're my best friends. There's, so I've still got lots of pictures of Lucy around the house. Um, so it's not like they were never to replace her because you'll never replace. You can't no. ever replace a dog. Um, but I love that I've had. I've had three dogs now. I had. A, I had a year with Lucy. It, it wasn't enough, but it was the year we had was the best year ever. Um, and probably for her as well. She was yeah. a rescue. 
Yeah, so she would have been so, in a kennel, so and yeah. she she hadn't had any interest in her. So she had the best year of life, and I can look back now and I do I smile about it because I just think she had the best year ever. It was one of the best years of my life. So, so mm. yeah, I always think that there's a lot, always a little bit of each pet filtered into the next ones. Yeah. I always think there's a tiny bit of personality. It it, it filters down, and it's again, it's because how, how you raise them and how you are with yeah. them. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. Laura Tot from First Dates and Diane James from Blue Cross Pet Bereavement Support Service. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. That's it for this pet cast, but there's tons more information on our website. So head over to bluecross.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you've enjoyed the episode, feel free to share it with a fellow pet lover. Or write us a review on your podcast app, which will help people find it more easily. I'm Gemma Atkinson. The Petcast is a Bengal media production for Blue Cross. <laughs>